a te nga koutou katoa. Me ti mata tātou pēnei me o ki atu au ki te tuata i tanga, ki te wana ke tanga o te wā. Nā te kore e ai, te kore te ui uia, te kore te rauia. Ko te kā ui kore ke ai te ai e te kā ui tara. Ka ua te kune ngā, te wāna ngā kano o iari koriko. Ka puta ki waha ko hou tūpua ko hou tāo ko hou ora. Mai rua tūpua, mai rua tā uto ka puta ki waho. Ko rangi nui e tū nei, ko papatua nuku e takoto nei. Ka puta ki waho ki te whai iao ki te ao mārama. E rongo whakairi hea ki runga. Turuturu o uti waka maua ki a tīnā. Tīnā. Ku ye, tāhi ki. Tāhi ki ye. E mihi tēnei, ki te hunga e whakarongo mai nei, i tēnei pō, ki te whakarewa te kaupapa, mata kui kui, o te hunga ka whiwhitohi. Hoi anō rā, ta huria tūrā, ki te hunga kua whetūrangi tia, e nui ngā ingoa i whakahua tia mai rā, o te anō rā, me ta huria tūrā te whakaro ki a rātau. Rātau te pō, huriatu kia tātou i te au awatea, te nga koutou. Te nga koutou e hara mai nei ki te kaupapo te pō nei, ki te whakarua atu rā te nei kaupapo tō tātou pirimea. I hua atu e nei tohu, a ki e nei tohunga mātanga i roto i o rātou mahi. Ka rehe kū mea roa, te nei te mihi atu kia koutou, e hara mai i roto i roto. I haere tata mai e noho tāwhiti atu ki runga ororo hiko nau mai, hara mai, te nga koutou, te nga koutou. Kia ora tātou katoa. Te nga koe. Kia ora. Te nga koutou. Kia ora koutou. Welcome everyone. Kura Moiahu, who is the Arts Council Member Committee, a Māori member. Kia ora rawa atu. Many thanks for your wonderful karakia. And kura for reasons which will become wonderfully apparent as we go on for playing a very important role tonight uh, throughout this evening's celebration. We really thank you. Tonight, everyone is about our words and our writers. In alphabetical order, because if I could say all three at the same time, I would Jenny Bornholt, Tessa Duda, and Sir Timothy Karatu. Congratulations and welcome, you three, and to our uh, uh, Welcome, wherever you. you are, whoever you are, we are so delighted to have you with us. This is the Prime, Minister Awards, uh, the Prime Minister's Awards for Literary Achievement uh, 2020, and this is a celebration of three writers whose words have helped shape our sense of who we are collectively. Three very different writers, but in their differences, to misquote Walt Whitman, are reminders that we are large and we contain multitudes. I'm John Campbell. I'm really proud to be hosting what I hope will be a lovely occasion online, uh, because who knew what COVID was going to do? You are so welcome to join us and to be part of it, to ask questions, to share your appreciation of our writer's work, or just to watch and bask in the words of three people who have helped lead us on the journey to who we are and to who we will be. The Prime Minister's Awards for Literary Achievement began in 2003. Our three recipients, winners tonight, whatever word you would like to use, are numbers 52, 53 and 54. Numbers one, two and three were Janet Frame, Michael King, and Horni Tufari. So this is very special company to be in. Indeed, if I were to read all 54 names, we would feel such gratitude, appreciation, and pride. This is also a lovely thing to win because it's accompanied by $60,000 each, and writers very seldom, I think, I'm smiling at you, Tessa, get that kind of payday very seldom. I love getting money, said Margaret Mahi in 2005. <laughs> she was stoked. And why wouldn't you be? So, Penny, Tessa, and Sir Timothy, pour yourselves some champagne, and I'll very uh, briefly introduce them. <laughs> and then we'll hear from the Prime Minister herself, and then from Michael Moynihan on behalf of the Arts Council and Creative New Zealand. And then we'll have a chat with our writers, and then we'll do some readings, and then a bit more of a chat, including your questions. Now, if you have questions, and we've already got some wonderfully, uh, please ask in the comments threads. The comments threads. Please do. We'd love to hear from you. Now, if this is all new to you, and if it is, we're really delighted you are here. Each year since 2003, the Prime Minister's Awards for Literary Achievement, hosted by Creative New Zealand, celebrate writers from Aotearoa who've made a significant contribution.
contribution to New Zealand literature in the genres of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. So three each year. This year in poetry, most of you will know this, of course, it's Jenny Bornholt. In fiction, it's Tessa Buda. And in nonfiction, it's Kimwati Hari. I'll tell you a little bit more about each writer as we go to them individually and we go to speak to them all at length, but these are careers of distinction and of decades, which I suspect have flown by. These are the words of us. In a country where the preciousness of language has always been understood, ko te reo, te maori, o te mana maori. That brilliant trinity is defined by Tiniro, poitu e kupu, poitu e mana, poitu e kenua. Of course, some of us were disgracefully slow to cherish the tonga that is te reo maori, but this evening we celebrate a man who has been truly central to that. Kei te rangatira, te kimoti, thank you. Such a thing. Okay. Okay. Mm. Right, let's bring in our first special guest. And it wouldn't be the Prime Minister's Awards for Literary Achievement without the Prime Minister herself. Our fourth PM since these awards began way back with Helen Clark. So here she is, the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. Namahi nui kia koutou katoa. I'm delighted to offer my congratulations to Sir Timothy Karitu, Jenny Bornholt and Tessa Duda, the winners of this year's Prime Minister's Awards for Literary Achievement. These awards are always a highlight of my year and I know it's a huge disappointment that we're not all together in person today honouring the winners. However, this evening's online event is a wonderful opportunity to pay tribute to Sir Timothy, Jenny and Tessa in their lasting contributions to New Zealand literature. Sir Timothy for his enduring commitment to the revitalisation of Te Reo. Jenny for her poetry of great clarity, humour and wisdom and Tessa for her elegant, poignant stories of New Zealand life. The Prime Minister's Awards recognise the importance of great New Zealand writing and the individuals helping us to see ourselves and each other with greater clarity, depth and understanding. Since lockdown, book sales have surged across Aotearoa, making this a perfect time to celebrate New Zealand writers and their work. It's heartening to see New Zealanders' appreciation for literature further reflected in the high number of nominations received this year. I hope that in celebrating our great New Zealand writers, we also inspire generations of writers to come. I look forward to meeting Sir Timothy, Jenny and Tessa in person and celebrating their achievements together in the new year. In the meantime, I hope you all enjoy this event and join me in congratulating this year's winners whose work has continued to advance our proud literary tradition. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Tanakwe, Prime Minister, helping us see ourselves and each other. Exactly. So the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. Before we move on, I'd really like to thank the Arts Council and Creative New Zealand for their role in these awards every year, plus Auckland Live and the Big Idea for their role in this evening's awards. I'd like to do a shout out or a sign out to Platform Interpreting New Zealand, who do a really superb job of providing accessibility to the arts for the New Zealand deaf. Uh, community and are doing exactly that tonight, as you can see on the screen beside me. I think <coughs> Stephanie, Kelly, Sosh, we are delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Of course, Creative New Zealand hosts the Prime Minister's Awards for Literary Achievement, and Auckland Live and the Big Idea have worked alongside them to put it online tonight. Thank you. And Unity Books, who are justly proud of their association with this event and their support of New Zealand writing. So let's bring in Creative New Zealand now and our next special guest, who is Arts, Arts Council Chairman. Michael Moynihan. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, on behalf of the Arts Council of New Zealand, Toi Aotearoa, I'd like to offer our warmest congratulations to Tessa Duda, Sir Timothy Karitu, Jenny Bornholt, who are all this year's recipients of the Prime Minister's Awards for Literary Achievements. While it's disappointing that we can't hold our usual ceremony this year, it is fantastic that we can get together for this online event and hear directly from each of these outstanding writers. Mm. These prestigious awards are a special way to celebrate the value our writers bring to Aotearoa. Each writer is notably active outside of the category which they have received their awards this evening. Tessa Duda also writes award-winning non-fiction and plays, Jenny Bornholt has written two children's books, and Sir Timothy has translated Waiata, among many other things. It's an honour to be able to recognise these innovative leaders in their respective fields. 
We're thrilled to have uh, John Campbell here with us this evening to lead the way. And I'm very excited and looking forward to hearing all three recipients read and discuss their works. I encourage you to use the opportunity to submit questions to the writers using the comments threads on Facebook and on YouTube. I might even ask a question myself. Thank you to Auckland Live who've made this event possible. And I hope you all enjoy this online panel korero and hearing the words of these outstanding Aotearoa writers. Noho Oromai. Thank you, Michael. They are prestigious awards and it's wonderful to be part of them. And it's fantastic that they have happened every year since 2003. Right, writers, Prime Minister's Awards for Literary Achievement recipients for 2020, Jenna, Tessa, sorry, Jenny, Tessa, so Timothy, let's bring you in. Congratulations. It's so lovely to have you with us. Um, Tessa, I'm going to start with you, Chickley, but yesterday we had a little bit of a technical rehearsal and you were just grinning from ear to ear. And I just, I yeah, this is, this is wonderful, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm still astonished and sort of reeling from, you know, this wonderful uh, acknowledgement of 40 years. So, yes, I am very, very pleased and happy. Yeah. J J Jenny, what's it like to be noticed? What's it like to, to, to be told that you have won this? Oh, hold up. Now, Jenny, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I've just... Oh, here you are. Mute. Yeah, so, we've got um, you now. I obeyed instructions. Um, <laughs> it's, it's extraordinary. Um, and it is a, I mean, it's a huge honour. And like Tessa, I do still feel um, surprised. And I feel slightly um, listening to Michael and um, Jacinda Ardern. It's, um, I feel slightly terrified, actually. So, <laughs> Um, terrified and delighted, of course. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a it's a really wonderful thing. Thank you. Well, don't be terrified because you deserve to be here. Your poems are wonderful, and we look forward to you reading them. A uh, couple of us, uh, sorry, a couple to us later. Uh, so, Timothy, um, you've described this. I was reading, I think, in the Big Idea, a signal honour, a signal honour, not only for me but for the Maori language. And you point out, and I think correctly, that Matamua uh, Koti Kupu is Maori only. Uh, and it is the first occasion on which this award has been made to a publication solely in the Māori language, which makes us very special, doesn't it? It certainly does. And it sort of says something, I think, for the country in that the language has been given the recognition it's long sort of craved for. So on behalf of all of us, um, I'm sort of pleased to be with um, Tessa and Jenny on this occasion and really quite flattered by the honour and thank, thank the Arts Council very, very much for it. When you say on behalf of all of us, Timothy, that is a big thing, isn't it? All of us. There's a lot of all of us. And, and, and it's a beautiful thing to say. Yes, of course, as we say in Maui, no kute ho nore, no tatakato, the honour is mine, but it's also all the, all the people to whom, I, to whom I'm related, the tribes in New Zealand, and so it goes on. You know, we are, we are not islands, like John Dunn says, we are not islands, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I, there's beautiful stories. And you were saying to Jenny, hey, did you get a message from Barbara Ewing before that you passed on to, to Jenny? Is that? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, and I, I was just, I was looking at a glorious piece of footage uh, from the early 50s. I uh, Sorry, the early 60s, I think. Nati oh, Ramana. Oh, a, oh, right. a TV performance in London. My goodness it, me. Yes. Was that the work of Sir Bernard Fergo? So it's a Bernard Freiburg. Yeah, and it's very moving. It's very oh. moving to see you and, wow. and the state of Māori in England. You, you know, yes. in, in te reo, with an English audience lapping it up. Yes, yes. It's, uh, that was the beginning of Ngāti Rānana, of course, the, the group that's there now. It's much bigger and stronger than it was in our time, but um, mm -hmm. it has grown um, in London. With the, with the support of the High Commission in London. So um, we're very lucky. It's a very lucky organisation. Mm. Yes, and Barbara was actually one of our performers. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. There you were yeah. together. She has sung with us, you know. Yes. Yeah. 60 years ago. Yes. And more, I think. Yeah, no, that's about right. Yeah. Wow. 
I, I, I want to talk to you later, but I do want to, I think of the reaction to say Hini Wehe Mohi singing the national anthem in Te Reo Māori in 1995. Oh, yes. The reaction was disgraceful. Or the reaction to Naida Glavish mm. simply having the audacity to say kia ora when she answered the phones at the post yes. office, for God's sake, in 1984. How yes. much has changed and how wonderful, if belated, is the change? Yes, well, even though it is belated, I think it's a move that New Zealand can be well proud of. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's a nice note. T yeah. Tessa, can I, can I ask you, I've been looking, there's some lovely photos of you reading to children in libraries and well, young, young people. What's it like when you have the book on your lap and nothing else, no screens, no special effects, and the words catch them and they go quiet and still? What is that moment like? Well, it's it's almost so special you can hardly hardly define it really. I mean, all children's writers know that, and particularly the ones who've done as I have, you know, literally hundreds of, of school <laughs> visits. You always look for that sense of engagement. Um, yeah, just just the, basically, it's it's the um, it's the importance of story really, and once you capture them um, with with the, the story that you're telling, well, then you're, you've, you're sort of home and hosed, really. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret Mahi used to emphasise tremendously the importance of just plain story. And that's what children's writers try to bring to children, both through the written works and through the um, uh, visiting of schools. And I saw some wonderful research recently from England that um, author visits apparently have a tremendous effect, far more than we've ever ever known in the past, uh, on children's ability to read and their love of books. So for all the work that the um, Read New Zealand, the former book council and storylines do to make sure that uh, writers get out to um, talk to children at schools, that is the most wonderful reinforcement that I've read in a long time. Mm -hmm. So yes, to all those children's writers who are busily you know, doing the rounds, it's it's the most fantastic work we could do once we produce the books. Yeah, I agree. It's really meaningful. And I hope people are tuning in tonight and experiencing at least one of the three of you for the first time. That would be very, <laughs> very exciting. Jenny, uh, can I come to you? And we're going to talk more specifically about uh, your poems later, and you've got to read us too. And I, I'm really looking forward to that. But I was just reading Flight again. Um, do people often pick flight out? Wow, it's good. And and I and I wanted to ask you because people always ask Tessa, is she Alex? And there's a little bit of, 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 of I mean, some of those details uh, are, are, are true, and some of them are fiction. But um, in flight, it begins. It came to pass that I boarded a plane, and as I edged past the man in the aisle seat, he said, "My name is Dove. Dove, Dove, Dove. Dove. I knew you would come." And then. I want, is that true? Yeah, it is true. Um, <laughs> Bloody good. <laughs> I know, wasn't it good? I felt he was sent to me, um, you know, especially. Uh, yes, he was sitting in his seat and he said that. And I, at that stage, I didn't know. I mean, it was just something that we exchanged. Um, and then the poem, he, he ended, he came into that poem. I mean, it, the story, the story about being, it's a story about being on a plane and um, the plane losing an engine and falling through the sky. It wasn't that plane flight, but I was on a flight where that happened um, with our son. Um, it was a truly terrifying experience. So, I mean, I, the lovely, what I like about writing poems, and I suppose it's the same for fiction writers, is that you, you bring together these things that might not otherwise belong together um, and you make a story out of them. Um, as Tessa was saying, I really love story. Um, and I think a lot of my poems tell stories. And this was one, so so there was the flight and there was the man who whose name was Dov and said he knew I would come. And then there was a book I was reading about a photographer, um, Sally Mann, and she talked about a place where she'd photograph, which is where a place where bodies uh, uh, human bodies are left to decompose in the open. It's a kind of scientific study place. Um, and that's, uh, that's the image on which the poem ends. So those, those things all came together to 
to make this poem. Um, yeah. Is this an interesting conversation? Is it? And, and we'll have it a bit more later. And, and, and so, Timothy, we're about to come to you for our first reading. But, Jenny, what requirement do poets have to tell the truth? I mean, if I, you know, I was talking about this with Bill Manhire at Word in Christchurch. If I found out that Philip Larkin had completely invented Dockery and Son, I'd be devastated. And yet, why? Why do poets need to tell the truth? Why do I want you to be telling me, at yeah, least? Yeah. What, and why does that matter? I don't think it, I mean, I don't think poets have to tell the truth and they often don't, um, or they might tell a, you know, a half truth or a, a tiny bit of a truth. Um, but I think what they're doing in even making, in making something up is telling a different kind of truth. I mean, they mm. tell the poem's truth, whatever that might happen to be. And uh, yeah, so I think you have to not mind too much about that. <laughs> Well, your, po your poems, truths are fantastic, Jenny, and we look forward to hearing a couple of them later. Uh, so, Timothy, I've been really looking forward to this. And, and, and one of the things I'm looking forward to is that it's never happened before in the history of the Prime Minister's Awards, which is a reading uh, appropriately, wonderfully in Te Reo Māori. And to introduce us, we're going to bring back uh, Kuda. Kuda, are you there? Are you, are you, have we still got you, Kuda? Uh, kia ora. So I think you're going to introduce Sir Timothy's reading for us, right? Uh, I he mātanga he pau o tō tātou reo rangatira, te reo Māori, mm -hmm. e te rangatira e tā tīmoti, tēnā koe he mihi nunui tēnei ki a koe mō tō aroha mō tō tātou reo, ara ki te tautoko te mano, a ki te whakaraora tō tātou reo rangatira, a me tō mahi ki te ako te reo, ki te tini, ki ngā mano, kei roto i ngā kura, kei roto i ngā kōhanga reo, ngā kura auraki, Nga kura kaupapa oki, me ngā ware wānanga, me ngā tarikā wanatanga ara te taurā uri te reo Māori, me te iatu e nui ngā tarahiti, a e kawiatu rā tō tātou reo ki tā wahi, nō reira e tā tīmo te karetu, nō mai haramai, te nā koe e te matua. E nā koe. He mihi. Nei kā noho a kaui oku mahara. Ka tuku ai ka rere ki ona papa, ki ona kapa, ki ona tānga te huhu anoa. Nga rere nei i tae ai te nei kohi kohi ngā whakaaro. Te tuku ki te ao, mā rere nei e whakatake e mai, e whakahe mai, e whakanui ke mai rā nei. A hako pēhea te wai aro mai o te tangata ki ngā kai, o te pū ki o re kōrero nei. Ka tohu mai tērā ki a au ko te rohia, mā te aha i tērā. Ki te kore te au haka, ko kore pe i pēnei te nui o te kōrero, o te kupu ka takoto ki te whārangi, hei kai mā ngā mata o ngā uri a tuā ki a rātou. E te au haka, tēnā no rākou tuka toa, e kawetunu nei i tēnei puipui a ki a tātou, ki ona tāmata ke no ātū, e paka miharo tia e tō koutou kaha, tō koutou wairua au waha, Tō koutou aroha anō hoki ki tō tātou reo. Nā o tātou pakeke te tohu tohu mai, kei whakahua hua ingoa, ka mahue ko e tahi, ka pāma mai ko e rā. I whai wahi atu au ki ona tani fao te au haka, i tōku iwi tonu, iwi kei atu anō hoki. Nā te aroha nui mai ki a au, ka tuku noa mai i a rātou kupu, i a rātou waiata, i o rātou whakaaro ki te huri o te au haka, ki ona pai, ki ona kore i pai. Kei roto i ngā kōrero aku mihi ki te hunga nā reira nei au, i whakauru nui mai. Nā reira, e kore whakararangi tia i konei. Kia ora, tēnā koe. Kia ora rawa atu, Sir Timothy. I've got a translation of that provided by Piripi Walker, for which I'm very grateful. But I want to say that that's pretty special sitting here and listening to uh, an award recipient reading a book that has not been translated 
into English exists solely in Te Reo Māori, and it is an affirmation of your singular love of that language and your championing of your language of, of that language and your determination to make it central to who we are. And I think you talk in that passage uh, of resilience, of creative genius, and of uh, the commitment to the language. And I, and I want to pick up on resilience. There must have been times when people who love and speak te rau got sick to death of being resilient. <laughs> <laughs> Had a guts full of it. <laughs> they certainly got a, they certainly got sick of such evil jikari, I can tell you. But, um, but you know that that probably is the, the resilience is really the people themselves because mm. they've suffered my brick bats for a long time and there've been very few bouquets. Um, but that is why we've got to the stage we are at now. There is a commitment among the younger speakers to sort of ensure that this language survives, and it's their commitment that I salute on this occasion. And their resilience, really their resilience. Mm. Uh, te Pani Kiritanga o Te Reo, the Institute of Excellence in Māori Language. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said, and there was this lovely interview on Wakahuia, and I've lost the quote, but you were asked about uh, people being afraid of you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, they are. Yeah. <laughs> well, I went and asked people who've been to <laughs> Te Pani Kiritanga o Te Reo, and they weren't afraid of you. They just admired you so much they wanted to get it right. You made them want to be excellent. That's mm. not fear, that's awe, which is a different thing. Uh, there are generations of people grateful to you. Mm. Well, that's very flattering to hear. But the Pani Kire Tango Te Reo, those students who came to that, um, came, came to visit, came as students for us, were those who were committed, highly committed to the, to the mm. proposition that this language means something to them and they wanted to master um, aspects of language that are not commonly taught in classes um, and a whole different level of language was what we were aiming for and that's what we've tried to feed to them. Gosh, uh, some of them are extraordinary, aren't they? Some of, some of yes. my colleagues. I mean, yeah. it's just magnificent the way they use Te Reo Māori. Yes. Yeah. What, what's it like to hear it? And I, and I go back to the fact you were the first Māori language commissioner in 1987 and there was a sense, and I'd love to hear your take on this, that the language was endangered under some threat. Was it? Were we losing it? I think there was no real threat. It would always survive with a few speakers. There will always be speakers of the language, no matter what happens. But my salient memory of 1987 is when I tried to put an advertisement in the Dominion to look for a PA who was Maori speaking. Therefore, I wanted the advertisement to be in Maori to test the language of the applicant. But the Dominion <coughs> refused to publish it refused to sort of run it um, because they said it was unfair to other people. And I thought to myself, well, that's a bit dim, you know, a bit dim on the part of the Dominion because really um, English was okay, but trying to find somebody who's Māori was up to par was what I was looking for. But that's, we've come from that to now where you can sort of send anything in Māori to any newspaper in the country and they will publish it. So we have moved on in great strides. Boy, we were late, though. I mean, if you think by 1987, what, we'd had homosexual law reform, we'd sent frigates to Mururaa Atoll to protest against French nuclear testing. Why were we so reluctant, so egregiously mean about Te Reo Māori? I think we were like that for any language that wasn't English. <laughs> I think Chinese speakers, German speakers, all other speakers of languages know that people look at them awry when they start speaking their own language in, in, in a crowd of English speakers. But I've learned to ignore them with all the, <laughs> with all the, you know, with all the, what's the word I can, I'm not cut <laughs> my bit, but I've learned to ignore them. Yes, let's go with that. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's very <laughs> nicely, that's very nicely put. So, Timothy, we've got some questions from you, uh, from people, uh, which is really lovely. So I'm going to ask them uh, later because we're going to move on to our, uh, to our next reader. But thank you. And it was thank so you. beautiful to hear you read. And it was thank so you. beautiful to hear you read in Te Reo Māori. Um, so let's move now to Jenny. Jenny Bornhold, I've been really looking forward to this because you, interestingly, have chosen poems from either, is my lens wide enough from either end of your, <laughs> from either end of your, your career, for want of a better term? Yeah, I have. Um, and career is quite a funny word, isn't it? Uh, you never horrible. think of career and poetry in the same no. sentence, do you? Uh, no. Yeah, I've chosen one from my first book. Um, and this is called In the Garden. 
So I'm going to read that and then I'll follow that with a poem from my, the, poem I've, the book I've just published. So, okay, this is In the Garden. In the garden, the bulbs run riot. Root systems go all over the place. We crack open huge dry clods of earth and uncover white bulbs of onion flowers embedded like fossils. Their roots like thin streamers partying down through the soil. So we have a white flower propped on the top of a green stem, a plain enough thing, while underneath the feelers are out, hooking into other systems, forming the network, the flower and undercover agent posted on the watch, a decoy of simplicity. Hmm. And then um, the second poem I wrote in memory of my father-in-law, Jack O'Brien, who was a, he was a hand printer and a great collector of books. And towards the end of his life, um, I had the privilege of sitting with him. And he said this great thing, he just said, something is everywhere. And so that was just a phrase that stuck. Um, so I wrote this poem, something is everywhere. Asparagus everywhere in the garden, like eggs laid by wayward hens. The river too is everywhere, rising up over the stone wall, over grass and the track, the boardwalk now an underwater path through trees, which still send fluff everywhere into our rooms, our hair. Dogs are everywhere. They bring their something fur on their something bodies and sniff and run around while their owners look at the everywhere river and think of somewhere, elsewhere. Everywhere inside a book was the place my father-in-law longed to go. Books being like the river, something and everywhere, beauty pulled in their lines of type. Gosh, that's good. <laughs> I love that poem. It's so good. Um, let's talk about the difference between them. They're 31 years apart. Ooh, so, that, oh. yeah. I'll tell you what, though. I reckon in the middle of in the garden, and you can just say, John, that's bollocks. Feel free to call me on this. But there's a, there's a classic born Holtism. Is that is that a thing? A born Holtian moment. And, oh, and, I quite like that. Uh, uh, and that is a plain enough thing, next line, while underneath. And I hmm. love the way you look beyond the plane and beneath the surface and behind things and through things and make the ordinary extraordinary. That's not quite right, I'm, I'm winging this, but do you think a plain enough thing while underneath is very you? Yeah, I think it is, that's a very, um. Yeah, there you go. You can go to the top of the class, John. Yeah, yeah I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it is. I, I do like the plane in life. Um, and I always think there's a lot going on um, in the plane. And it's, yeah. I guess it is what I look out for. Um, and I do like what's underneath. Um, I think there's always, there's always an underneath to everything, um, which is worth having a look at this this might just be me trying to to make a merit out of journalism jenny uh and, and it could be a hopeless case but you study journalism and work for a year on the waimati daily advertiser right and, yeah, so I did. You, and you would have done everything there and, and i and and you and you had to make a newspaper right and some of it would have been thoroughly ordinary but it still had to go to print because if you didn't there would have been no newspaper did you learn then the, the, the virtues of seeing news, of seeing importance, of seeing human significance in the ordinary? I, yeah, I, I think that's right. I did, I think I learned an awful lot in that year. And you're right, I did have to do everything because I, I, was, I was it, actually. I was, I was the only reporter on the newspaper and everything I wrote went into the newspaper, <laughs> which, um, you know, as a first year, um, you know, just out of journalism school, that was slightly scary, um, probably for the readers as much as it was for me, actually. Um, 
And yeah, I, th I think one of the things I learned in that year was that I really loved, uh, I loved people's voices and I loved, um, I loved interviewing people and I loved uh, things, I did things like I went to big bail field days and I went to all kinds of odd things. I did court report, I mean, I did everything. I did court reporting, I went to council meetings and I loved, I just loved, um, I interviewed sheep farmers and uh, you know all, all kinds of people and it was completely wonderful and I think I learned a lot about I learned a lot about language and I learned a lot about story and I think those things are what I carried over um, once I stopped being a journalist um, and into, into my other kind of writing life. We've got lots of questions coming for you too, which is really nice. Uh, Tessa, I'm going to come to you in a sec, but one, one final question for Jenny. Although Tessa, I know you weren't allowed to be a court reporter because you, right, that's right, it's because you're own, your own new girl and court reporting was for the boys. I think that's right. So Jenny got one up on you. But Jenny, just before we move on, and I, I, we were celebrating Sir Timothy for the way he has made us see and hear things that we ought to have seen and hear, heard. And, and and which disgracefully had been shoved into the margins by some of us, appallingly. And I wonder if you have felt, and, and, and it's a false equivalence here, but I wonder if in a way you've felt with your anthologies, which I know you're very proud of and which are beloved and celebrated and widely bought, uh, the, the pride of taking our poetry to us. Oh yeah, I do. I mean, I, I love. I've loved doing those anthologies. I mean, the most recent one was short poems of New Zealand, and I can. I just. I love that book. I know you're not meant to say it about you know, right. books that you <laughs> books that you've been involved with, but I. I just love being able to have those poems um, between covers, and I love the fact that people will read them. They might. Um, they'll connect things that they might not otherwise have connected. They might read poems they might otherwise never have read. And I just, I get huge satisfaction from that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you should, they're fantastic. And um, we've got some questions for you too from, from people who are with us, which is delight, delightful. We're so delighted to have people joining in. Tessa, let's come to you. And you've got a reading, and this is a very exciting reading, the third of our three very exciting readings, because this, Tessa, is where it all begins, right? Kind. That's right. <laughs> well, um, the reading I've chosen is the first couple of pages of the first Alex book, which was published in 1987. And this is Alex about to about to race against her great rival Maggie, and she knows that if she doesn't win this race, her chances of going to the Olympics are nil. So it's a crucial race for her. I have always known that in another life I was, or will be, a dolphin. I'm silver and grey with a permanent smile on my face. I leap over and through the waves. But right at this moment I'd give anything for that freedom. I am a pink human, caught in a net of ambition and years of hard work. In a few minutes I will dive into that artificially turquoise water waiting at my feet. A minute later I'll either be ecstatic or a failure. I stare at my toes, which are white with fright. How will I ever get my legs going with feet of marble? My arms describe drunken windmills. My heart is already pumping away as if it's gone berserk. I hear in lane three, Alexandra Archer. Automatically, I step onto the starting block. In lane four, Maggie Benton. In the lane I wanted to be and should have been on. Cheers and shouts for her too. Oh, I stand head down, nothing will make me look at her. Since we hugged goodbye this morning, we have avoided each other. I hope she is feeling as ghastly as me. We all step down. I walk back to the chair where a woman in a blazer waits to take my track suit. Yes, I did put my swimsuit on under all this. People happened in the past from nerves. Then comes the gold chain, bearing my most precious possession in all the world, and his pearl, his tear. It goes deep into my tracksuit pocket. Oh, I'm cold, appalled at what I have to do. I stand tall, centre stage on the first run of the starting block. Under the night sky, I feel almost naked. Just me, the body Alex, fit, ready, dangerous. A whistle blows somewhere. I climb up to the block as to a guillotine. 
shouts and cheers echo around the pack stands. Then silence falls like a curtain. I make a last adjustment to the cap clinging to my ears. I need a pee. Take your marks. I curl my toes carefully around the edge of the block. Crouching, I look along the 55 yards of smooth blue water in front of me. Up and back we'll go, flat out. I feel tired already. Heads or tails, this throw is for you, Andy. Beside me, someone starts to move. Bang! Alex, you're dead. Maggie's got a flyer on you, a glorious flyer. You're beaten before you've even started. Isn't that a great start? Isn't that a great <laughs> start? No, I mean, that, you're in, aren't you? You're, I mean, you're in, figuratively, I, and the, <laughs> literally, and the readers in, figuratively. I uh, believe so, yeah. Yeah. So... I don't want to, because you've been asked this question so many times, but I just want to do, I do want to put on the record that as a teenager, you swam butterfly for New Zealand at the 1958 uh, Cardiff Empire Games, what we now call the Commonwealth Games. And and you probably would have gone to the Olympics in Rome, but you just, you just lost the, you just didn't want, you just got, had a guzzle of training, right? So that, so, the, 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 but I don't want to talk about the biography unless you want to. But I think we understand now. I love the fact that you say Alex is, you know, there's a little bit of you in here, a little bit of Dawn Fraser in here. I mean, this is fantastic. But I do want to talk about children or writing for young people. Because I was looking at our fiction winners um, uh, since 2003. And, and if we look at many of them, well, not, not many, but a significant number have written some of their fiction at least for young people. So Margaret Mahi, Jack Lazenby, Joy Cowley, Morris G, Janet Frame, with the Maida, Patricia Grace. And, and we seem to do writing for young people brilliantly now. But when you started with Night Race to Carlo, uh, which was, I think you started writing in 78, right? Was that the case at all? No, it wasn't. Except for Margaret Mahi and also Joy Cowley, who at that stage were building up strong careers in Britain. But here, uh, the local publishing was almost non-existent. And I think it was Elsie Locke who wrote a piece in The Listener, which uh, probably triggered uh, a, uh, an explosion, not a renaissance, because it wasn't a rebirth. But an explosion of children's writing, I believe, happened with Morris G. His Under the Mountain, I think, was the beginning of it. And then Gavin Bishop came in at the same time, and myself, and one or two others, and from about 1980 onwards, that was really when it started and it, it exploded. And of course, we began to realize that Margaret was something extraordinarily special, yes. which culminated in her winning the Margaret Mahi, sorry, the um, Hans Christian Andersen Award back in 2006. Uh, and her career was just you know, quite astonishing. But I, I think that since 1980, beginning with Morris G, I think there's been this wonderful uh, explosion, um, development, maturing of children's writers, and we've got some absolutely great writers coming through. Well, have been since 19. Um, my timing was very good. Actually, I would like to say something about the this autobiographical thing because I've been told, and it's been written over the years that it is semi, Alex's books are semi-autobiographical. And I actually resent, oh, no, I don't <laughs> resent. I, I, um, um, I, I, will, I dispute, thank you, that's the word I'm looking for. I dispute that because there is parts of me in Alex, a lot of knowledge that I retained from all those years swimming up and down the pool. Um, Dawn Fraser, yes, a couple of my daughters, yes. yes. So you roll them all up into one and you come up with a new character. But I remember discussing this with, Witty Hamara at one point, and he said he has the same problem, that people somehow seem to think that if it's biographical or even semi-biographical, that somehow it's cheating. And they sometimes you get the feeling that people are uncomfortable in just the fact that you you can actually make this stuff up and you can make up <laughs> a character up. So, yes, I, I was rather resist that mm. uh, connection, that because I swam competitively in the games, then... The Alex books have to be sort of my story. Mm. But there are lots of things that happened to Alex that never happened to me. Mm. Uh, strong females. And, and 
uh, you chose the name Alex because it's a kind of gender neutral name, right? And you hope boys would read it too. But exactly. strong females. And, well, I, I, and, and as the father of a, of a, of a strong female, uh, I, it's important, isn't it, for, for young women to see strong young women? Well, I can take back in 1982, which was when, uh, sorry, 87, which was when the first one was published. Um, I had four growing daughters and I was very aware of what they were reading and I just felt there were very few mm. books around at that point showing girls taking the same sort of risks and having the same sort of ambitions as boys. And so that was partly one of the reasons why I wrote those books. It was quite considered, quite deliberate. And I think, you know, we've... we've um, We've matured a lot. We've we've got wonderful writers like Mandy Hager and Fleur Beer yeah. and, uh, writing, you know, fantastic stories for girls. You have uh, the Storylines Tessa Duda Award established to recognise your outstanding co contribution to children's literature, both in publishing output and in your in your work to promote children's books and, and publishing. And, and I wonder what it's like when you read someone young. Who, who you maybe have not heard of before, writing brilliantly for young people, and and knowing that you are part of that legacy, that you are that you you know is is that fantastic? Oh, of course it is. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, when they named that award after me, I was totally embarrassed actually. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I I mean, this year's winner is a uh, a writer from of of the Tessa Duda Award. Um, is the uh, writer from Havelock North. And when I read it, her manuscript, my hair stand out, you know, stood on end. I thought, well, if there's any one of 28 uh, submissions that comes anywhere close to this, it'll have to be bloody brilliant. <laughs> this, this really was quite outstanding in itself. And I was just thrilled. Uh, and in the end, she was chosen as the winner. And uh, we, you know, that that's a career that's now on a, a, a on a trajectory and and is going to go somewhere. As a, she will make an um, an impact as an historical novelist. I'm quite sure of that. That's very exciting. And mm. and and maybe she'll be as successful as Alex. The paperback yep. of Alex is Penguins New Zealand Penguin New Zealand's best ever selling work of fiction well, for adults and children. That's not quite right now. I think. It certainly was for a time. It was the it was their best selling work of fiction. I think it's probably been that's been overtaken. But I can tell you something straight off the press. Um, I heard today from Penguin that they're going to reprint Night Waster Car. Forty years on. <laughs> Forty years on. <laughs> yeah, this isn't it. Is, it started in nineteen seventy eight. I think published in eighty two. Right. The, your that's first. Correct. Yeah, and, well, and, and I hope and, they won't mind me telling you, but um, oh, no, no, well, I'm just that's, that's, I'm just thrilled a bit. I really am. It's 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 a great story because Dad is dispatched with early on, and, and <laughs> 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 which is as it should be. <laughs> we've got we've got um we've got lovely questions coming in. So Timothy, I'd like to can we come back to you? Thanks, Tess. That was absolutely lovely. We've got um uh really nice questions coming in from people, and I, they feel heartfelt. So, Sir Timothy, I'm just going to read this one out. What are the key things that need to be done to encourage more writing and publishing in today's Māori? And I, I, I mean, the writing is one thing, the publishing is another, as you know. Uh, what are the barriers that need to fall and the opportunities ahead? I would think that initially publishers have to sort of see that there is an audience out there that's going to read these publications once they're printed. And uh, to accept that their part of this whole whole publishing business is going to ensure this language sort of goes to goes to much um, goes to different levels, covers different topics, and will survive well into the into the next millennium. Um, it is a it is a duty, I think. That might be a bit too strong, but you know, I, I speak strongly sometimes. It must be the duty of publishers to really consider publications in in Maori only, without having to do a translation every time, um, because there are some students who want to study the language on its own without without having to resort uh, to a translation. But I, I applaud the publishers who are taking the initiative now, and there are a number of them, mm -hmm. and they have my heartfelt gratitude. 
Isn't it wonderful when uh, people respond to something that that is a manifestation of the best of us? And I'm thinking of the of the of the of the record collection CD collection Waiata, which went to number yes. one. Yeah. And 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 here we I was listening to Beck Ronga, uh, Heidi Myra Sway earlier. Uh, yes, and, yes, and yes. That was a beautiful song to start with, but if anything, for me, it, it packs more of a punch into our novel. What yes. was that like to see that? Go to number one on the charts because you work with anywhere he and yes. as, as, as translating and overseeing the kind of translations, right? Yes, yes. In the musical field, there's no greater Philistine than I. So, um, <laughs> Vic Rung up, um, who I've got to know just this last week very, very well, um, was not never on my my list of favorites. Um, but she's got to change my mind after hearing her and meeting her this last week. And with a number of songs, there's one of the songs that 660 sings. Yeah. And they sang it in the documentary in English only. And I thought, what a dreary song. <laughs> but, but with the translation, it's really come alive and they've made it come alive. So the addition of a Maori lyric here and there is probably a positive thing and gives the song that extra je ne sais quoi, which I think we all long for in our writing and in our composing and in our songs. Hear mo kito. Ukaipo. Ukaipo, yes. Yeah, and that, and th can you tell us about translating? Because this is a very good time to make the point that translations, in order to work, have to be beautiful rather than literal, right? Yes. A literal translation would thud. And would be nonsensical in most cases. Um, because uh, what, what works in English quite often does work in Maori if it's mm. literal. So you have to look at what the singer is trying to say, and that's quite often. Difficult, as I was saying to them last week at the, at the seminar we were at, my greatest problem is that I cannot understand the English of the current composers. And so it's hard to different, hard to translate. So anyway, he's been my translator between the younger generation and their command of English, such as it is, and my my command of English, because of the schools you and I both went to, I hear, John. I think we went to the same, <laughs> yes. well, to the same oh, prison. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, I, got, yeah. I got regular thrashings and canings. I suspect you didn't, Sir Timothy. No, no. I was in Fair House for five years, and we. Uh, no, you had to be really naughty, John. I can't believe that you. <laughs> uh, get, get, get. There's a lovely story <laughs> about about your mum and dad writing to you when you were a boarder at Perth House. Yes. Writing yes. to you in Maori. How many other boys at Perth House were receiving letters from their mums and dads in Maori? It was only because my mother didn't know much English, and it was easy for my father to write things in, in Maori for her to read it before it got to me. So that's <laughs> that was the reason, but. Māori was always the language of our home, so it was pretty natural. It's not unusual or anything. Mm. Not for my generation anyway. It's pretty unusual oh. now, I would think. Yeah. No, not a, not among the younger generation. I think they would write to each other in Māori too, this current Māori-speaking generation. Yeah. Yeah. It's no longer such a acute thing as some people might think. Hmm. Uh, Jenny, can we bring you in here? Um, and, and this is a... This is a question I suspect you often get asked, but but why is poetry important, and and why do so few words work? So 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 what makes a poem work? And I, I think of, I mean, people would have had your poems read at their weddings, for God's sake. So so what's at work there to make it so important for people? Uh, I think poetry. Um has a way of getting um, getting to the essence of something to of a feeling or a or an experience um, or it, it can do that um, I, I don't know that there's any I don't think there's any one thing that makes a poem work I think all kinds of things make poetry work and poetry is so various um, that I think it's very hard to pin it down which is also what makes it such a, a great form to be working in um, and yeah, I love the way that people um, people read poems at weddings. They read them at you know, weddings and funerals. funerals I, yes. Yeah, I think it's really interesting too that people will. That's that's where people go when they when they want to um, when there's an occasion when there's something that's really important that they um, they want to celebrate or mourn is they always go to poetry. It's people don't read, you know that. They don't tend to read a, 
a prose fragment at a wedding it's always you know it's always a poem um it's it's so interesting that they this is the form that they go for um and again i think it's something to do with perhaps the musicality of it the um the emotion that's expressed in a very you know tight sort of concise way uh yeah i mean poetry is terrific i think um, <laughs> so do I. you know <laughs> I think poetry will cover any occasion actually don't just save it for weddings and funerals I think no. you can you know put it to put it to good use yeah um I want to uh I want to this sort of lovely poem uh which I'm very fond of uh please comma pay attention it's I just please pay attention and then at the, the beginning of the next stanza open your eyes I mean you I'm sure you don't read it like this in such a declaratory fashion. And then the second to last stanza, be wild and curious. It's such good advice. And I suspect all three of our writers have been wild and curious. When you write a poem that is wild and curious, but actually because it's you looks measured and considered, are you playing a trick? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh... I don't think I'm playing a trick. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, maybe I'm playing a trick on myself. I, um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Because uh, people always say, so I'll explain my question better. People yeah. always say that you are very much a poet in, in control, right? That, that, yeah. there is a, that there is a fastidiousness about the architecture of your poem. And I say, yes, but that doesn't exclude a great passion. And, and actually often your poems feel visceral too. And that's a hell of a balancing act. Oh, well, um, thank you. I mean, I do, I do, um, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work. I don't really know what to say. There's a lot, I mean, there's such a lot of work that goes into a poem. I mean, you have to, to get that kind of, um, I guess to get that tightness, um, mm which is often there is really, and that concentration is a really tricky thing. Um, but I, I mean, I think that's the work of, of writing a poem and it's what's so enjoyable about mm -hmm. it. Do you whittle yeah. back? Do you start with more words and? and... Uh, I don't necessarily start with more words. Sometimes I do, but um, I might change to different words or um, shift things around a lot. Yeah, there is a lot of reworking that goes on um, to get that kind of, um, to get get them sounding right, you know, feeling right. Um, do you know? Do you know? I, do you have a moment when uh, when you just think, "Yep, that's a banger." And you sit, <laughs> you sit back at your desk, yell out, "Gregory, is that?" Do you have that? Do you have, do you have those moments? You know? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do have those moments. Um, I do. Um, I might be a bit quieter about it than that, but yeah, I do. <laughs> Um, and it does feel it does feel fantastic. I mean, it's I, it's such a um, it's such a great feeling to think that you've actually got what you wanted um, on the page. Yeah. Um, Jenny, thank you. We're we're getting lovely questions, and I want to read. Uh, this, uh, actually, Tessa, I'm coming back to you, and we've sort of covered this off. Except I want to. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a development of what we were discussing before. You described the 1980s as the time when New Zealand children writing took off. In fact, it might, it's possibly a response to the conversation we were having not long ago. Uh, thanks to writers like Morris G and Margaret Mahi. How do you see 2020 for children's literature? And who was having the most impact on it now? I guess you've slightly addressed that, but I sense you're really excited by where children and young people's literature is at. It's a slightly mixed bag at the moment, I think. Um, we've got some great commercial publishing happening. And there we have sort of wonderful people like Lindy Dodd who managed to combine both. She's both a critical success and, uh, and very commercial. Um, I think there's one area, and that's young adult writing, which is struggling a bit at the moment from what I hear. And I'd like to see that reverse, certainly. But we've got some great writers who are being published by the mainstream publishing. And we've also got um, people who are self-publishing. Mm -hmm. And there are some of them, like Lani Wink Young is a name that springs immediately to mind. Yeah, she's fantastic. They started off self-publishing, stuck at it, learned how to do it, and then jumped the big 
sort of divide, if you like, into mainstream publishing. And so there are people in the self-publishing area who are well worth looking at and encouraging um, because, you know, that is now an alternative route uh, to get published. It was always hard. It's still hard. But self-publishing is now a, um, a viable route and can lead to, you know, greater success. Let's encourage people. What, what was it? We, we talked about Carlo before. What was it in 1978 that made you think, yes, I, I can do this? I'm going to, that's my, that's my dog. That's my dog. Good boy, man. <laughs> He's sensing at 7.30. I promised him a walk when it was over. Uh, what, makes, what makes one think that they can write? and endeavor to do it and, 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 and sit out bravely. How do you do that, Tessa? <laughs> um, in my case, it was like catching a disease. Um, I suddenly woke up one night on holiday up at Carl and decided that I had a story in me which I need to tell. Um, four years later, that book was published as Night Race to Carl in 1982. And it really was a, just a, a bolt out of the blue. I, I sort of instinctively knew that it had to be a children's story. Um, I could have made it some sort of rather um, dreary feminist tone because this was 1978 when the second wave of, um, of uh, feminism was, had definitely arrived in New Zealand. But I knew instinctively that, that probably a children's book would be the way to go. And I just stuck at it for four years and eventually had a... Um, uh, a manuscript which I was lucky enough to put into the hands of Wendy Harricks at Oxford University. Mm, mm. And she taught me just about everything I know in a very rigorous editing process which cut down the original manuscript from 90,000 words to, to 60. So we cut out a third of it. But it, the book was so much better for it. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just been a... Uh, that really started me on wanting to tell more stories, and so Jelly Bean followed, and then Alex five years later. And by that time, I was regarding myself as a full-time writer. Um, and just, it was my job. That's what I did. Well, you've done it beautifully. Absolutely beautifully. Thank and, you. And, and there are generations of, I'm not, and we've talked, I mean, not just children, but there are generations of us who are grateful for it. Is it, can we, is there anything you'd like to say? Well, well I'll just do, Jenny and Sutemoti, I'm just warning you that I'm just going to do concluding remarks in the, in the, fa in the fashion of the sort of thing we're hoping for from Donald Trump any day now. Tessa, <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you'd like to, you'd like to say before we go? Um, well, I, I, as I said at the beginning, I mean, this, this award has been an amazing surprise and just I suppose a gratification for you know 40 years and about 50 books because mm. I have written all sorts of things apart from fiction um, and I'm just very grateful to Creative New Zealand and the Prime Minister's um, support of this of this award and I just like to think that I've still got more books in me I've got a historical novel that I'm working on at the moment and um yeah, I just like to think that there's still some. Well, I always said that I'd like to write something which topped Alex, and that I think is still my um, mm -hmm. <laughs> is yeah. still my uh, ambition. So thank you to everybody for. We, uh, we we really wish you well with that. Thank you, uh, Tessa, thank you. and 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 uh, thank you uh, for, for the joy you have given uh, so many of us and the delight and the love of words. Thank you. Uh, that is a very special thing to have done and to have done it for so long. Uh, J J Jenny, is there anything that you would like to say? I, I, I would like to say, and, and I think this comes to the point that Tess was just making, that she wants to keep getting better. I think you are, Jenny. I think your most recent collection, which was out last year, is, for, for my money, your best yet. Wow. And that's a high bar. Do you feel do you feel that way? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I do feel that way, actually. And I think that's um, that's the thing about having 
been writing for so long, um, even though it doesn't feel like that long at all, uh, it's a it's a terrific thing to have been able to continue on doing this. And it is, it's been things like this this award which have enabled that to happen. I mean, because I know you're not meant to talk about the money, but you know, as Janet Frame or Margaret Mahi said, you know, it's fantastic. Yeah, and good. what it does is is give you time. Um, so that's a wonderful thing. Um, also, congratulations to Sir Timothy and Tessa, because I haven't said that yet. It's I just feel, I mean, it's such fantastic company to be in. So um, that's that's a really lovely thing. Um, and also, I just, I think the fact that the Prime Minister's Awards exist is a really great statement, hopefully, about the value that um, the country places on literature and um, how important it is to um, to our lives here and to us. So thank you to everyone who's involved with that. Mm, lovely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Sir Timothy, I, I, I mean, we've, we've acknowledged you tonight, but I wonder if we've acknowledged you sufficiently, although this award does that and a knighthood does that and a celebration of you does that, uh, but for your contribution to that extraordinary taonga that our Māori cannot be overstated. So thank you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> it's, it, we have been enriched by it. And you have been singular and determined and bloody minded and brilliant. And, and it, it, I hope you feel like we have, those of us who were slow to appreciate the treasure we have, have noticed and that you have been so central to us noticing. Thank you. Um, I think th this award has to be a, a feather in the cap of Creative New Zealand and the Prime Minister's Award for accepting that Māori language has its own ethos, mm. it has its own command of, of all the subjects that we've written about in English. You can do them in Māori as well. So um, that acceptance, I think, is a major one. And I think on behalf of all speakers, who are fighting for the survival of this language, I must um, congratulate the Prime Minister for, for accepting me, for, for accepting me as the winner, or mm -hmm. appointing me as the winner, but on behalf of the whole of, of the Maori world, to let them know that there's a niche in this award for speakers of the Maori language and writers of the Maori language. And the fact that this has been the first one in Maori solely has to be um, something that we congratulate the selection panel on. So, yes, I couldn't agree more. Kia ora. Well, Sir Timothy, Aritu, Tessa Duda, Jenny Bornholt, uh, thank you. It's been so lovely being in your company, not just tonight, but over years. And we are richer for it. It's been a lovely hour and seven minutes. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you for your generosity, uh, not just tonight, but for decades. And congratulations on all you have achieved, and Tessa, all you will achieve. <laughs> and, um, thank you thank I, you very much I want to shout thank out you. the Creative New Zealand uh, Kura Moyahu uh, Michael Moynihan uh, Heather Byrne who I've been dealing with who's been a, a joy to deal with Auckland Live Big Idea Platform Interpreting Stephanie, Kelly and Sosh and everyone who's tuned in everyone who's tuned in to this most unusual award ceremony <laughs> in these COVID times but we've had lovely company from our wonderful writers. So thank you if you've been here tonight, either as a participant or a viewer, we are grateful for you. And Kuda Moyahu uh, is going to say farewell. Thank you all so much. Ko i kohinga ngā puto i kōrero e oki atu koutou tatau ki te ahuru mō wai. He ahatekai o e nei rangitira kua kōrero e a nei i tēnei pō. Hei mātanga i te wakairo te kupu me te kōrero mō ngā manu e kai ana te mātauranga nō reira. Ki te, toko, ki te toko toru, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā koutou katoa. Ka ranga ka ranga ki a ranginu i etu i honei, ka ranga ka ranga ki a papa e takotone. Pā i e te ie o te tōo ene o te rā ki te waka au ora te tīnana, te inengaro me te wairua o te tangata. Ka oki au, ka oki atu, 
ki te maa ana o te aroha i runga i te ara wanaunga e rongo whakairi ea ki runga turu turu o uti waka maua kia tīna tīna huie taikie pomarie